Hello. Let's see how much range I have. Test, test. Oh my gosh. Walking to the back. Check for feedback. Hello. Can I get all the way around? The video guys won't like it. Hi. I'm just checking. I got one minute left. Don't judge. Just around. Okay. Should we get started? Yeah? Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Allison Miller, and I'm giving the talk in the circle room. Uh, defense, games we play, defenses and disincentives. So if you're looking for Will and the cold reading talk, it is in the small room. Go, go, they already started, if you want to be seeing that talk. Out here, we're not going to be talking about cold reading. We're going to be talking about economics. So if you want to talk about cold reading, go, go, go. <clears throat> so uh, basically, the purpose of this talk is I'm a defender. How many defenders do we have in the room? All right. How many folks who enjoy attacking occasionally? Every once in a while, you like to break stuff. Cool, cool, cool. How about you're just interested in information security? You haven't decided yet if you're a breaker or a builder. Maybe a few people who are learning stuff. So uh, I'm a defender, and I have had uh, some time defending both platforms and customers from external attacks. Typically, the platforms are large, consumer-facing. And um, I've been doing this for many years, and so I am really tired. And both me and my management want to know when I'm going to be done, you know, when the system's just going to be defended and I can go to sleep and we can stop investing in more infrastructure in order to fend off attackers. So one of the things that I was wondering is, um, uh, is if, there's some, if there are things that we can use from economics and game theory to help us design systems that are more resistant to attack, right? Uh, information security is actually kind of in love with economics. We use analogies from economics all the time in order to justify what we do or explain it or prioritize our work. And so uh, game theory is a branch that I haven't seen that much applied to InfoSec and I wanted to, to think about it a little bit because, so I don't know uh, if any of you are managers or you have to convince managers to spend on a regular basis, but you may have heard one of the following. Hey, uh, I want our systems to be secure, uh, but we, I really only want to spend whatever we need to spend to be compliant. Or uh, I, want, I want our systems to be secure, but I only want to invest enough so that I don't have to be that guy. And that guy is whoever was just breached, right? And so when you're investing to that level where you don't want to be that guy, you don't need to be the leader, you don't need to have the most secure systems in the world because you want usable systems too. But if you, if you are making security decisions based on just being better than who got breached, that kind of is akin to the analogy that you don't have to run faster than the tiger, you just have to run faster than the slowest guy. And that makes a lot of assumptions about how attackers work and how attackers think. Um, and, and if we look at economic principles, those may, those may or may not really play out and be a good way to um, firm up your strategy around how you're going to invest. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about game theory, about what it is, and how games are set up. So this is about game theory, not gamification. So if you were hoping that I would reward you with a badge or that you could uh, rise up in the leaderboard as far as this conference, that would be a different talk. This is about game theory. And then together, we will walk down this path and figure out how, how can we take our work and set it up as a game and then, and then win which is a concept defenders don't really get to think about that much because defenders don't win, defenders just survive to play another round, right? Attackers win, they win every time they get root, right? 
And then, and then they're on to the next game, win, 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 whereas defenders just survive. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of my experience associated with laying in defenses that are essentially disincentives, meaning not necessarily uh, blocking a behavior, but discouraging someone from even attempting it. And then we'll wrap up. All right, so some, some of the economic uh, concepts that are kind of important if you're going to use economics as a place to uh, provide analogies or support for your security strategy. The first is the most important in my mind. It's, it's utility theory. So uh, is anyone sort of familiar with micro macro economics? Took basic class in it. OK, so what's utility? Utility is, I, I swear I heard someone say it, it's value. It's, it's whatever someone is getting out of a system. Uh, you can think of it as a proxy for money, but it doesn't necessarily have to be money. And so uh, if we're thinking about what motivates attackers, attackers are motivated to maximize their utility, just as defenders are motivated to maximize their utility. That's one of the main assumptions of economics, that participants in a system are there to maximize their utility. And that could be, if your company could be about maximizing profits. But what motivates attackers? Is it always money? In fact, it is not always money. In many cases, utility has to do with getting some other good that they're either going to convert into value or that they enjoy in and of itself, like happiness, or the thrill of the chase, or the thrill of the win and getting root. Another concept that's kind of important is externalities. Uh, externalities, basically, that's when you have participants in a system, but there are impacts to folks who are not directly involved in the exchange or in the system. And, a, and an example, a classic example of externalities would be pollution. So you have manufacturers and buyers of whatever the manufacturer is making, and uh, pollution that is generated by the manufacturer, who pays for that? It's not necessarily the folks who are engaged in the trade of the good. It's all of us. And so uh, pollution is a good example of externalities. Another example of externalities, a little more positive, has to do with network effects. So. A company like eBay, for example, the reason why they were able to grow is because they were able to have both buyers and sellers on the platform. The more buyers they got, the more sellers wanted to join their platform. The more sellers they got, the more attractive it was for potential buyers, and such and such, and so they grow. And as we look at large, mainly consumer-facing platforms uh, in the area and in our lives, you can see that that is true. There are network effects, positive externalities um, that allow folks to extract benefit based on the uh, interactions of others engaged in exchange. Uh, information asymmetries. So this is often discussed in the context of pricing. It's basically what it sounds like. You have two participants, but one of them knows something the other doesn't know. And so uh, the reason why I have a picture of lemons up there is because information security itself is, has been referred to many times as a market for lemons, meaning you, know, you can have many folks out there who are selling security or selling tools, um, but the recipient doesn't necessarily know that they will work or how they will work until they implement them and try them. Uh, information asymmetries exist in a lot of markets. Another, well, I mean, the classic one, of course, is used cars. The dealer may know it's a lemon, but the buyer doesn't until they've bought it. That's a problem. How do you resolve that? How do you get to the correct price as a buyer if you don't have all of the information? Of course, the buyer has information, too, and that's how much they're actually willing to pay. And in a negotiation, of course, you don't share that first out the gate. You try and game your information asymmetry to get a better price, less than your maximum that you would be willing to pay. So signaling is something that exists in order to correct or game information asymmetries. Oftentimes, signaling is, uh, is to blame when companies are accused of anti-competitive behavior. Uh, and as essentially what you will have is you will have participants in a market, somehow they all arrive at a similar pricing strategy. How do they do that? Well, they have 
they, 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 may, be, they may be engaging in signaling so that uh, even though they are competitors, they can uh, work together to make sure that they can work together by signaling to each other in order to uh, come to a common price that is above what uh, demand would naturally lead them to. And then the last thing, and this is really important because we're in uh, information security, which is of course driven by technology, is marginal cost. So if you're thinking about the cost structure of your organization, you have to buy this good, you have to buy that piece of software, but, um, and, and you may have a variable cost that is associated with how many units of something that you produce. Marginal cost is how much does it cost you to buy that next thing or do that next thing. And um, we enjoy, in the software industry, enjoy in many cases a marginal cost of zero. Meaning uh, the first unit that we produce of, of a piece of software or a tool or a technique, okay, you think about malware writers or you think about someone who's doing vulnerability research, that first break, that's expensive. That's all of your research and all of your attempts go into making that one good. But then the copies of it, the cost of making the copies of it, that's zero. So when we think about, about both defenses and offensive techniques, getting to the defensive or offensive technique may cost us a lot of time and money. But once it's in place, of course, we like things that are automated because it ends up costing us less if we're seeing a large volume. Our cost doesn't depend on our volume, it depends on our initial investment. Marginal cost is, goes to zero. So what is game theory? Uh, game theory is actually a branch of applied math. And what it, it, what it does is it studies, it tries to estimate, tries to uh, extrapolate uh, what will be, what is the optimal decision for participants in a game to achieve, and what are, what is, what are they likely to achieve? Uh, so, any scenario that's constructed as a game, there will be some rules around it, like you guys have to make a move at the same exact time versus moves may happen sequentially. And at the end of the game, there's some kind of payoff for each player. And the trick of it is that the, the choices that one player makes will dictate the payoff of the other. So when you go to a store and you buy something for $1.99, you know it's going to be $1.99, you pay $1.99. But in, in a game, for example, an auction, what you actually pay or what, you're, or what something ends up costing depends on what everyone else paid for it. So uh, this, this is why these scenarios are often associated with competition. Game theory is also applied or um, in some cases requires cooperation, but most of the time the scenarios have a competitive element that influences how the participants um, behave. And so uh, it is used as a framework across a lot of disciplines, it, uh, primarily economics, but also biology, philosophy, and if you're in business, negotiation, military strategy because you want to frame a problem that you're trying to solve. You have an, an adversary, a competitor, potentially a collaborator across the table from you, and you know that your payoff, your outcome, depends not just on what you want and what your demand is and what the supply is, but also what they choose. So I really like this as a defender. I'm thinking there could be a lot of opportunities here if I could just frame my issues in this way. Uh, and this is, how, this is how game theory is discussed. This is a payoff matrix. So if we look at player one and player two, I've set up a symmetric game here. Both player one and player two have two choices, A and B. In an, in an asymmetric game, maybe player one would have A and B and player two would have C and D. But just for purposes of this discussion, and if player A chooses A, then they have two potential payoffs. If they choose A, player one, they may get, um, oh, did I mess that up? They may get A1 or they may get, well, they will have A1 or that should probably be like A3 or something like that. But a, they will have A1 and then player two um, gets to choose A or B and then that will dictate what player one gets. And so you read it sort of, 
Um, player one chooses A. Well, that's why I sort of set it up. That actually doesn't show payoffs. It just shows their choices. So you can see how to read a matrix like that. Another way that uh, games can be described and can be set up is in a decision tree. So, um, and where else in InfoSec do we see decision trees? Well, uh, there is attack tree modeling, which uh, if, you, if you're into risk or threat modeling, maybe you've seen attack trees. Also, something like a decision tree could be just used to describe how your system works, like how the code works. In any case, uh, this particular game, I didn't mean to do it, but happy circumstance that I did. Um, the last game, in the last game, the way that the, the uh, uh, Okay, in this game, let's assume for a moment that player one doesn't know what player two chooses and they have to make decisions simultaneously, which is sort of a first level game. Um, and then in this decision tree, what we see is that, is that player one makes a choice and then maybe player B gets to see what player A, what decision player A gets to make, and then they get to make their own choice. And then player A gets to play again. So this is a, a repeated, um, this is a game where folks have multiple decisions to make before they get to the ultimate payoff. And you can see how if you are player A or player B, you're already, you're already, are you guys already looking to the payoffs to say, oh, if I was A, I wouldn't want to go that way because then I don't make any money at all, no matter what B does. And that's exactly, that's exactly the, uh, the right kind of, um, intuition is that, and it's, it's absolutely natural, you want to maximize your utility. Okay, so a few classic games, some of which you've probably heard of. Who's ever played chicken? All right. Did you raise your hand too? How does chicken work? Okay, keep it clean. You're more risk tolerant than I am, and then you'll win. He's going to push things closer to the failure point, the breaking point. Yeah, all right. OK. Uh, so that, that is true. He will win if his risk tolerance is higher than I am. But let's get really graphic. What's chicken? It's me and you. You're in a car and I'm in a car and I'm driving straight at you and you're driving straight at me, right? And I'm looking at you and you're looking at me and what's going through your mind? Who's going to turn first? Who is going to turn first? So why might you turn? Because I'm chicken. Because you're chicken, but you're looking at me. Why might you turn? You've got the crazy eyes. I've got the crazy eyes. He might turn if he thinks that I won't. He might turn if he thinks I'm crazy. He might turn if I've ripped out my steering wheel, right? That's the classic way that you win chicken. You look at the guy and you're the first one to rip out your steering wheel. You don't want to be the second one to rip out your steering wheel because then you're just going to die. And I actually think that's losing more than if you swerve and lose your Mustang and your pink slip. Um, or, yeah, right, pink the papers, that's what they call you give a, okay, all right, because there's another pink slip. All right, okay, so that's chicken, that's exactly it. Um, the, the person who will lose is the one who swerves and you will swerve if you think the other person won't. And if you want to win, then you signal that you're crazy by ripping out the steering wheel and giving them the crazy eyes. That also helps, but um, you know, it depends on how fast you're driving if the crazy eyes really look that crazy. Okay, so the next game, a little less popular, uh, it's called Volunteer's Dilemma. And Volunteer's Dilemma is, we are all gonna get a party, right? Free drinks, all night, we all get it, as long as one person mops the bathroom, which is gonna take all day long. So everyone wants the party, but no one actually wants to do the work. And so um, oftentimes what will happen, it, this is the volunteer's dilemma. Are they, gonna, are they gonna sacrifice themselves and do this work so that everybody can get the benefit? And uh, unless there are the right incentives placed, the answer is no, we will all have to pay for our own drinks. 
Um, the opposite of this is tragedy of the commons, which uh, you may have heard of in reference to commons, which is that there is a common good that we can all share as long as we agree all to only use a little bit or our, our, our allocated share. But here's the thing about the commons is that no one's monitoring the comments. So if you cheat, you might get a little more, and no one would notice, because it's a big common good. But then if you cheat, then you might cheat. And then if we all cheat, then there's no common good left for anyone. So that's, that's what makes it the reverse of the volunteer's dilemma. Everyone is kind of encouraged to cheat. And so when that happens, then there goes the commons. And the last uh, game theory game is probably the most famous. Uh, probably, there, you may have heard of John Nash, beautiful mind, great mathematician, took game theory and economics to the next level um, with Prisoner's Dilemma, which, let's see what I did. Did I, did I actually, oh, I did, look at that. Okay, so Prisoner's Dilemma is um, there's two of you, you've committed a crime, you've been put in separate cells, the bare light bulbs swing in and they're saying, hey, are you gonna, are you gonna confess, confess, because your friend's gonna confess. And, and uh, what, the, what the, the game is, is that if you both keep quiet, you will both do okay. You'll, you'll get off, not scot-free, but you will, uh, it, it won't be too bad. Um, and, and if you, Sorry, if you keep quiet, then you'll both uh, have a very good outcome, very light punishment, slap on the wrists. If you both confess, then you will be punished, and it will be uh, a bad punishment. But if you keep quiet and your friend confesses, then you get all of the trouble in the world. And so, uh, so what you see here is that you don't know what your friend is going to do. And of course, you have this person saying, oh, but if they confess, then they're going to go off scot-free, and you are going to have to take all the responsibility. How many movies have been made around that principle alone? Um, and these are, this is the potential payoffs. You can kind of look at it. And so, all right, so that's how the games are set up. So how do we then predict the outcomes? Number one forgot to put it on the slide, maybe I'll discuss it later, I'll talk to you about it now, is uh, one is that we assume all the participants are economically rational, meaning they seek to maximize their payoffs. Naturally, I think that we all kind of understand this is true, but we need to be very specific about it. They, everyone will be rational and they will consider all the outcomes and then they will maximize their benefit. No altruism, just economic rationalism. So, um, what are the options here? The options are that folks can cooperate, they have the option to cooperate, or they have the option to defect. That means cheat. That means screw your buddy. That means you're, you're, gonna, you're just gonna be economic, pure, cold, hard logic. You're gonna defect. Um, and, then, and then naturally, with those sort of tensions, you're gonna have some strategies that are dominant and some strategies that are dominated. And what does that mean? What that means, a dominated strategy is one where you have an incentive to defect. So your payoff will be maximized if you don't cooperate, if you cheat. Um, and so uh, if folks are economically rational, then dominated strategies won't be played because people will not play positions where their benefit is not maximized. And once all of the dominated strategies, the weak strategies, um, are, are gotten rid of, then the game will sit at equilibrium, meaning everyone will play a strategy um, at which they do not have an incentive to defect. There can be multiple equilibria, but, um, but then the, the game will rest there, and we can predict the outcome, that the outcome will be an equilibrium of the game. So, uh, oh, and Nash wrote an awesome theorem to describe equilibrium, where, as such, they've selected a strategy, and neither side can change a strategy independently and improve the position. So there's a really neat equation where he shows this is true when all of the dominated strategies have been removed. Um, and there's, I've almost got that equation uh, understood. And someday I'll share it with you. It will be lovely. Okay, so 
And equilibrium is the, optim is the optimal solution, meaning uh, it's, got the highest expect it's got the highest expected value for the collective outcomes, each player's outcome together. So if we look at uh, the, the prisoner's dilemma that we have set up, what, I what would be the best? What is the highest uh, expected value collectively that player one and player two could achieve? So I'll give you a hint, add them together. Which one is the least bad? Uh, keep quiet. Correct. So the answer is both keep quiet. Why? Because they only get teeny tiny punishment if they both keep quiet. And plus, they'll have better karma, right? They didn't rat out their buddy. But, hmm. If player one was looking at those odds, they go, okay, well, how do I maximize my benefit? If player two keeps quiet, then I keep, and I keep quiet, well, you know what? I could get no time at all if I, uh, if I defect, and that will maximize player one's benefit. Likewise, player two looks at what player one's options are and says, whoa, if they keep quiet, then I could just confess. And so they are both encouraged to defect. So even though both keeping quiet is the best ultimate solution, neither one will choose it. They will both choose to confess. And then that's our outcome. That's our equilibrium. They each get a little punishment. So much for altruism. OK, so let's, go, let's get back to information security. I was living in econ land. You could hear I'm talking in voices a little bit. So let's, let's get back. Back to Bay Threat. OK, so let's set up some risk problems as games. That means we need to identify the competitors, figure out what the rules are, figure out what each player ha Show me your moves. Anyone got moves like Jagger? Well, bring them out. OK, and then we describe the payoffs, and then we can figure out if it's a single mode or repeated game, and then we can do some analysis based on the payoffs, right? We could just figure out which strategies are dominated, remove those and figure out where our equilibrium is and then um, stop working, that would be nice. But that's, that's uh, I'll give you a hint, that's probably not going to happen. Okay, so uh, using Tragedy of the Commons as an example, I was trying to find something in the InfoSec world that works like that and the closest I got was spam. So uh, spam, obviously, uh, our collective bandwidth, the bandwidth of the internet, as big as it is, as much data as there is on there, uh, there, there is a certain portion that is used by spam. And, and an individual, an individual spammer, in thinking about what their options are, they could say, well, I could not send spam, which is horrifying and everybody hates it, or I could send a ton of spam out and have a teeny tiny response rate, I could make some money. And it actually cost me less to be a jerk and send out a ton of email than it, than it doesn't cost me that much to do that. Once I figured out how to send out a spam in an automated way, I could just keep on doing it. Um, and like the commons, our collective bandwidth uh, suffers if folks overuse resources. So uh, that, is, that is where we are, that, that an individual who could spam uh, when looking at their choices may decide to do that, and oftentimes they do, because uh, they have very little marginal costs associated with sending out emails, and so they will, in the case that they will get a very, very small payout, all things considered. Right, so what will they do? Yep, deplete resources. All right, next up. Okay, so here's, what, here's the example that I came up with uh, for chicken, which is around uh, vulnerability research and disclosure. So what does the vulnerability research have? They, have? they have two choices, really. If they've done the work and they found a vulnerability, they could report it responsibly, or they could weaponize their code and sell it to the highest bidder. Uh, and then asset owners, say software developers, they can either uh, cooperate with, a with responsible disclosures by rewarding or acknowledging and fixing stuff. Or they could not. They could say, oh, that's not, I, 
I, that's not even a bug. I don't even know what that is. Uh, oh, we're working on that. It will be ready soon. We'll let you know. And so what are, what, and if I made up payoffs here, but I thought that it would be relatively close, which is that a vulnerability researcher, probably if you, if they, um, if they disclose responsibility, let's say it's a, a small, it's a moderate payoff. <clears throat> uh, to exploit, they may actually get more out of it um, if they were to sell to the highest bidder, and they lose out if they've reported responsibly and they're deferred by the asset owner, both because uh, the asset owner is not acknowledging them, also because someone else may just someone else may weaponize it, and then I'll, and then they did this work and they didn't actually um, enjoy any benefit, and the software didn't get any better. So I think we can all agree, though, that the worst, the worst case is uh, when folks are irresponsible and a lot of uh, software and potentially end users are impacted by insecure code. So that is our, that is our, uh, that is our sort of like a mutually assured dis destruction kind of a thing. Um, but what are folks, and, and where are folks encouraged to go? And we are as an industry trying to find incentives to encourage responsible disclosure because if you look at the if you actually look at the payoff matrix I am not sure that the right incentives are in place um, to encourage everyone to uh, act responsibly okay anyone think of any other examples of are you kidding me I have 10 minutes left all right oh well, then we will skip finding other examples of that move to volunteer dilemma uh, which I think data breach cost info sharing is a good example of, is you have victim, a, a victim that comes forward and shares information about their data breach, which is something that we're all interested in. They get a very limited payoff and, in fact, high consequences potentially um, when other folks aren't as, as forthright. However, as a community, we don't benefit from uh, breaches being kept secret because that information is often exploited downstream. So, uh, and we talked a little bit about how games are won. You get rid of the dominated strategies, find equilibrium, and then as defenders, and potentially as attackers too, because attackers can use game theory just as much as defenders can. I think that our best road to maximizing our payoff truly is actually by changing the games, and that requires actually manipulation of payoffs. I can tell you right now I'm going to be running over. Okay. Um, so uh, in thinking about information security, now we're in the section where we actually try and construct our own, our, our own problems around defending and attacking as games, the first thing to do is figure out what our moves are. So I came up with, uh, for defenders, what our moves are. And uh, roughly, they fall into these categories. Things like authentication, filtering, whether it's uh, based on content or activity, blacklisting, whitelisting, rate limiting, Things that determine there's a human behind a keyboard, obfuscation and encryption, and access control. Uh, and then, of course, for every move, there's a counter move. And uh, as we are putting our pieces on the board and getting ready to play, we need to figure out we need to figure out what our payoffs are. And figuring out the payoffs requires determining the value of the asset to the participants in the game and the uh, frequency of attack expected and then how much must be diverted and then, and then how much friction um, or how much disincentive exists in how the game has been constructed. And does this sound familiar? It should because that's risk management, what I just described up there. That is, that is valuing assets and figuring out uh, what the likelihood of attack is and such and such and oh my gosh all roads lead back to risk if you're me um, okay, Which makes sense because game theory is actually a framework for making decisions and Risk management is a decision-making framework. So we're kind of talking uh, this we're talking about the same thing so Defenders, what defenders are doing is they're essentially 
uh, responsible for uh, environments where events um, manifest some kind of risk and putting the right controls, whether it's disincentives or uh, removing, deferring particular risk out of the environment. And they may do this in context, meaning based on what's happening on the system, or they may do this um, based on how the environment is actually defined. Sorry, that was a little abstract, but... Um, and, and how do they do that? They, uh, they implement automated risk controls, which could be something as simple as a firewall, or uh, could be something more complicated, like a quantitative risk model that is actually looking at uh, event level activities and making decisions about whether or not to honor them. Now, when we talk about risk management, not all risk has competition associated with it. For example, a tornado. There is no competitive element associated with that. However, um, all competition, all games, uh, have risks associated with them. And so thinking about risk management and game theory together makes sense because risk management is also about uh, maximizing payoff in the sense that it is associated with minimizing loss. Five minutes, no problem. Okay, we're just gonna go through half of the presentation in five minutes, right on. Okay, so what I have right here is I set up a scenario. I could have done this as a decision tree, but there would have been a lot of loop backs and also the screen doesn't go that long if we wanna read it. So this could be, um, almost any kind of consumer, the attack against a consumer facing platform. Let's pretend it's spam for a second and we're gonna whip through it. So uh, on the left side, we have our attacker and on the right side, we have our defenses that are built into the system. And so if we, if we play this through, the first thing that you're gonna do if you wanna spam on, let's say, a social network is you create an account so that you can send messages on that network. And the most simple thing that that provider can do is require that you be real. And so you, ver you need to verify your email so that we know you're who you say you are. Uh, which, of course, an attacker who's driving down their marginal cost is gonna script that, in which case then the, we up the ante by putting in a CAPTCHA. And then, and then how might you get through CAPTCHAs in, a more, in an automated way? Yeah. India, someone said. I was thinking Mechanical Turk, but I will take that. What you do is you find a low cost human capital in order to outsource a CAPTCHA, because a CAPTCHA does require there be a human behind there. You can Mechanical Turk that, or uh, you can put something of value behind a CAPTCHA, maybe some type of entertainment material people would want for free. I've just heard rumors of that. Of course, I don't actually have any proof that that happens, but uh, outsource the CAPTCHA, and then the platform comes back. They say, all right, but I've seen that cookie before. You've been here before, so I'm gonna rate limit you around the number of accounts you can create by your cookie. And they say, all right, well, I'll just throw up a bunch of virtual machines and then create accounts across that. My cookie is different, boo. And so they say, all right, the, come back with, okay, can rate limit by IP too, which of course can be defeated if you have a fast, a fast moving proxy um, across a number of different accounts or you just rent a botnet or you make your own, of course. Let's, let's, let's keep it cost effective here, people. And then, and then the platform really sort of exhausts simple things they can do around identity and then has to do some more sophisticated, potentially behavioral or, um, or uh, account linking. And so they look for similarities across accounts trying to figure out if you look like people they already know aren't bad. In which case, this one's one of my favorites actually, which is that, well, the way that you don't look fake is you don't put John Doe as the name for all of your accounts. You go find real people on a public facing social network and you can scrape their identities and then randomize them and inject them back in as, as new profiles. Okay, so then the platform goes, okay. Well, then what I can do is I can only, I can make it so that new users only get to send 
new users have to wait, they have to participate in the community and achieve better karma before the, they will be allowed to send bulk messages. They could send individual messages, but you, know, you can kind of rate limit that way. In which case, all that the attacker has to do is wait, maybe script some, hello, I like foxes, you know, some sort of random content, doesn't even have to make sense, but they can participate in the community. Then they get reactivated. Okay, now the platform has to do content filtering, uh, add authentication challenges, in which case then the attacker can just steal more credentials. Maybe they've already done that. Maybe that was part of their pre-work for this. Maybe they got a different scam going where they can, they have credentials, something Something that is associated with something real world, like a name, address, phone combination, someone's social security number, someone's credit card. In which case, then the platform gets really stuck. They may have to require manual verification. Like you have to answer your phone, or you have to, they have to mail you a code or something crazy like that. Or they have a person answer the phone and talk to you about uh, how much your mortgage payment was last night, because they're able to pull that from a credit bureau. Uh, and then, of course, an attacker can still defraud. There's still more moves that an attacker can make. Uh, and so, now, if we look at this, if we think about this, what drives costs? Because here's the thing. As soon as an attacker's cost associated with something like this, this was spam, remember, but it could be uh, monetizing stolen credit cards or account takeover, as soon as their costs or their expected value hits zero, why are they going to, they're not going to take on any more costs. So what, what drives the attacker's costs? Almost everything here can be automated. What needs to be paid for? CAPTCHAs. CAPTCHAs, right? That's really annoying because we actually don't want our consumer facing sites to be using more CAPTCHAs. What else costs money? I think someone's ordering something at the bar, not answering me. Okay, so there, there, anything on here that drives the attacker site, the uh, platform defender is encouraged to do. Uh, and likewise, there, the, anything that requires manual intervention, intervention on the platform side is less likely to happen, and so that's a place where an attacker can put pressure. Oh, except for one small thing. What is that? What kind of game is this? Oh, yeah. Oh, one small thing is that it's not just platform versus attackers. There's also users here. And any friction that the platform puts in is also going to be borne by users. And so that means the payoff matrix has to be changed to include not just uh, what the preventative value is for an attacker, but also figure out what the cost then is going to be in customer churn or uh, customer contact or uh, customer unhappiness. That, so that can be incorporated into the payoff matrix or you can reconstruct your game to be multiplayer. Uh, and so since I am now over time, I'm still going to finish, but I'm going to run through this because this talks about the cost of making decisions. There's always a cost when you make a wrong decision, but sometimes there are costs associated with making right decisions because of externalities. So we're almost done, except for one thing, which is to remind everyone that one of the major assumptions that we started with here is that uh, folks are economically rational. Uh, which we know to not be true because of this new branch of economics, behavioral economics, which studies not what the economic models tell us should happen, but what actually does happen. And a quick game, and folks who have just come out of the cold reading game can also play, because this is super fun, which is it's the ultimatum game. So I, if I gave you $100, you'd be very happy right now, right? But if I told you you had to split it with this gentleman here, you'd be thinking, okay, well, that sounds okay. And here's the thing. You have to split it with this guy, but he decides if he will accept the split. So if he's economically rational, what will he accept? Anything. He'll accept a dollar, two dollars, 35 cents, because... He wasn't expecting to get anything when he sat down in that chair as far as money. So in any case, he's up. But would you accept 30 cents? Uh, no. 
Do you have an idea? If I was going to give her $100, what if she offered you 20 No. How about if she offered you 50 Yes. Yes. Okay. So this man is very nice. Uh, how many of you wouldn't accept unless she gave you 75 Well, as it turns out, uh, most people will not accept if they believe that it is an unfair split. Even though, they, even though choosing no means they get nothing, they, most people will actually reject if offered anything less than 30 bucks. And some people will require quite a lot more. And this particular behavior occurs not just here in Silicon Valley, let's say, where $100 is a good amount, but you know, not, your you know, not your life savings, but it occurs across the world, even in places where getting a dollar or $2 would be quite a lot because people perceive it to be unfair. Emotions matter. And actually the part of the brain that is activated when offered an unfair split is the bilateral anterior insula, which is associated with disgust and revulsion. Whereas if a more fair offer uh, is given, then the part of the brain that is activated is associated with cognition, thinking, and logic. And that's because people are not just economically rational concepts of fairness, fear and punishment also come to play. So therefore, the idea that I came in with that game theory could help me construct better defense systems technically, and I was kind of interested in that. The answer to that is the economist's answer. The answer is it depends. So it's a useful model, but like any economic model, it's just a model. What's really useful after you have constructed your model is to then fit in with it with actual data and experience and analysis of past behavior because the thing that will always help you predict future behavior best is understanding historical behavior, which if you know me, know that that lands me exactly where I started, which is doing a ton of data analysis and statistics in order to figure out how to predict where the bad guys are. So it's kind of bittersweet. In any case, we are now at the end. Thank you so much for your attention. If there are any questions, I will take them now. Thank you. You can clap now. Are there any questions? No. OK. Come up to me afterwards if you have questions. I will be here. Bye. So it looks like we're running a little bit behind now. Uh, let's try to make it back here in about five minutes or so for the next presentation. And just a reminder, we do have the DVDs back here. <laughs>